In this video, I'm going to show you how to create your own Dungeons & Dragons adventure, The Lair of the Bullywogs. Hello and welcome to Attacks of Opportunity. I'm your host, John Sprunk. Today we're going to continue with our series about how to build a campaign for Dungeons & Dragons. Please hit the subscribe button below. Thank you. Last video we discussed how to create a setting for your homebrew campaign. Now that we have a starting location and some regions for the PCs to explore, we're going to create a specific adventure. This is often generically called a dungeon. The campaign begins with the adventurers on the road to Fort Ogard, which sits on the border between the Pomars and the Ulex states. If you watched the last video, you know that the Pomars is a wild and crazy place filled with monsters and humanoids. As they hike toward the fort, the adventurers come across a grisly scene. Several overturned wagons and dozens of bodies all around. These were families on their way to the fort to start a new life, except they never made it. I placed this encounter here for a few reasons. First. I want to establish the atmosphere and tone of the campaign right off the bat. It's dark and foreboding. This is not a campaign for the faint-hearted. It also gives me the chance to put down some breadcrumbs for the party to follow. In the last video I explained that the big central piece of this campaign is a module called the Temple of Elemental Evil. Now I could have started the campaign running the module as written with the PCs going from a starting location, to the moat house, to the temple itself. Except, this is going to be a hex crawl campaign, and the players are under no obligation to follow my plans. I want them to explore and role play and find the adventure for themselves. So I leave breadcrumbs or clues for them to follow if they wish. If they want to go somewhere else, that's okay. I have more adventures planned in this region. I also tend to have my players complete a few mini-adventures before they dive into the real meat of a new campaign. Um, first level characters are very squishy, as I'm sure you know, and having some experience under their belt will help them survive better. Also there's a chance to roleplay and explore, meet the locals, um, find out some interesting rumors, those kind of things that can really build atmosphere and make a campaign come alive. If the campaign is heroic, these intro adventures also give the players a chance to become local heroes, helping people, maybe getting some notoriety. So in this campaign, the massacre is the first clue in a long chain. At the scene, the party finds long wooden darts protruding from some of the bodies. These are quite primitive, but also lethal, obviously. They also find a survivor. A human girl about 10 years old, unconscious among the bodies. Alira, the cleric, casts a cure wound spell to revive her. But even when she comes around, she doesn't talk. She's obviously in shock and very terrified. The party decides to take her to the fort. Fort Ogard is a rugged frontier town, like the towns in the old western movies. The players get inside, find an inn, get some rooms, and then start asking around about the caravan. Unfortunately, no one seems to know the girl or her family. Just more victims in a vicious land. The party does find out that the darts are similar to those used by bullywogs, small, vicious amphibian humanoids who plague this river valley. Lately, they've been coming bolder. The fort's soldiery is concerned about them, but they don't have the manpower to do anything about it. Armed patrols sent out don't seem to do much good, and some don't come back at all. It's a good thing there's some adventurers in town, right? Of course, I'm setting up the player characters with the opportunity to become the heroes of this story. I say opportunity because nothing is guaranteed in my campaigns. If they want to be treated like heroes, they'll have to act like it. Leaving the mute girl with the local temple, the adventurers leave the fort to try and track down these raiders and put a stop to them. They follow the river east. Now, as I said before, this is a hex crawl adventure. So I put goodies and things to find in every hex 
so no matter where they go, they're going to find something. A few miles outside the fort, the player characters come across an old riverboat, half submerged in the mud. They investigate and are attacked by a huge crocodile, which tries to eat Rolf. Defeating the creature, they discover an old steamer trunk in the hold of the riverboat, inside of which are some moldy clothes and a silver necklace that has an engraving. A woman at the fort gave this necklace to her lover when he left to pursue adventure. He never came back. Later on in the campaign, when the PCs return to the fort, they track down the woman and give her back the necklace. They lose the treasure value of this item, but they gain experience points for doing good deed. As the party makes camp along the riverbank, the entire region is rocked by a huge storm. As lightning and hail fall all around them, the party tries to find cover in a small gully, only to be attacked by large snakes that come out of holes in the ground. This storm is part of a, the bigger story, but the player characters don't know that right now. It's just something that happens to them. The next day, they continue along the river, and they find an old town, while well, the ruins of an old town. The buildings have all been burned down and razed, with only the foundations left behind, but they find in the middle of the town is a fountain, pristine, beautiful, and still working. A little investigation reveals that the fountain has a slight magical aura, and the water is clean and pure. While they're refilling the water skids, the party encounters a family of sprites, small fey creatures with wings. They're friendly, and they approach the party. During the conversation, the sprites mention the Bullywogs, who are a constant problem for them, and they give the party directions to the lair. This is pretty cut and dry. I'm not making it difficult for the party to find the lair at this point. Um, the difficulty will come in trying to eradicate the Bullywogs. After a restful sleep beside the fountain, the party sets off eastward and soon sights the ruins of an old castle. This is the big set piece for this region, and here's how I made it. I started with a map. I decided to borrow one from The Princes of the Apocalypse, which is published by Wizards of the Coast. Um, although I rarely run published material anymore as written, I still buy a lot of them. I mine them for good ideas and maps. Nothing wrong with borrowing from published materials. I drew some tunnels underneath the ruins with a big central lake, and then I started populating the dungeon. When I'm writing an adventure, I use Microsoft Word. I find that text documents are the best way to manage my notes. I usually start with the backstory. Uh, this castle was originally built to protect river traffic. When evil humanoids began to take over the region, the castle was sacked and fell into ruin. About a year prior to the campaign's beginning, a tribe of Bullywogs found the castle and made it their home. They are led by a charismatic chieftain named Far Black Spattergoo, a name I proudly stole from another Wizards of the Coast material. <sighs> Ever since, the Bullywogs have been raiding up the river and making a bit of a name for themselves. Now the adventurers know nothing of this backstory, except that the Bullywogs are in the area and raiding. So why is it important? Well, I keep this backstory in mind when I'm making the dungeon. I want to have a consistent, cohesive product. If I just make a map and fill it with random monsters that have no connection to the story or each other, it's just a chaotic mess. A place for the adventurers to go, kill some stuff, get some money, and leave. It's forgettable. But if I make it about a race of evil humanoids that have a backstory, and this is their home turf, and they're going to fight to protect it, then it becomes more memorable. That's what I want, because I want the players emotionally and intellectually invested in this adventure. As the party approaches the castle, I read this description. A small castle overlooks Strand River. A crumbling gatehouse and a keep stand atop a low bluff, surrounded by vine-covered walls that extend down to the water's edge. Two of the outer towers have fallen in upon themselves, creating mounds of rubble. But one tower remains standing by the riverbank, guarding an artificial harbor. The entire keep seems old and worn, on the verge of collapsing into the water. The point is a little recon around the castle. 
They don't see any sentry or sign of life inside, so they go in the front gate. The first obstacle they encounter is mud. The entire castle and the tunnels below are filled with a thick, stinking mud. Mechanically, this is difficult terrain, but it serves more of a purpose than that. It's also atmospheric. It lends some flavor to this adventure. In the actual campaign, Alira the Elven Cleric didn't want to get her feet dirty, so Ralph had to carry her through the gate, and Cathra was making fun of her for being a dainty princess the whole time. That kind of banter is great. It ties the party together, and it lends a little levity to the situation. It's also something people never forget. As they pass through the gates into the inner bailey, their bickering has alerted a pair of giant frogs who are standing sentry on the inside. The frogs are submerged in the mud up to their nostrils and they leap out and attack. Uh, Rolf has to drop Alira to draw his weapon to defend himself. Uh, she goes plopping in the mud and the fighting is going to alert some Bullywog sentries nearby who would join the fray. The frogs and Bullywogs are not affected by the difficult terrain of the mud because they're used to it. Um, I did this because Bullywogs are not very interesting as foes. They're small and they're weak and they can be killed by a single blow most of the time. So I give them the advantage of numbers and a certain primal cunning. After defeating the frogs and the Bullywogs, the PCs begin a systematic sweep of the castle outside area. Most of my players have been playing for several years, so they're pretty methodical about how they search these places, which is good, because it forces me to up my game. They find and defeat some rats and a carrion crawler lurking in the stables. These aren't very difficult encounters. Uh, they're mostly meant to give the party something exciting to do while they search, and also to reflect the unclean nature of this place, that it's run down and not well kept. Um, they do find an old skeleton in the stables and it has a ring engraved with the words the pomage land of liberty and prosperity. Just a sardonic reminder that this land was once civilized and thriving. As they investigate the last standing tower the party is attacked by a bugbear mercenary. Uh, he serves as extra muscle for the Bullywogs, lured here by the promises of wealth and a steady supply of fresh meat. Uh, he's big and hits like a Mack truck, um, but the party takes him down. He has a bed made of furs and uncured hides, and under those hides the party finds a big sack filled with silver pieces. Now this is the first coin money the party has found so far in this adventure. Um, it brings up an interesting point. Why do monsters need coins? Um, I get that they could take them off, you know, travelers that they kill and rob, but what value does money hold for these kind of creatures? They can't go anywhere and spend it and buy stuff with it. In a dungeon populated mostly by just monsters or monstrous humanoids, I try to reduce the amount of actual coinage found just because it doesn't make much sense for them to keep it around. But in this case I make an exception because the party is pretty poor and they really appreciate the cash infusion. Next the party searches the keep. Now the upper floors are in ruin and have collapsed so only the ground floor is open to explore. There are no foes here, no monsters. The Bullywogs that were staying here all rushed out to the front gate to fight the party already. So they'll find remains of food and beds, that kind of thing. They'll also find stairs leading down into the tunnels. Here the party finds cave-like chambers and passageways. And the Bullywogs will throw themselves at the invaders, the invading party, over and over again in waves. I'll describe how the Bullywogs leap out of the shadows, throwing their long darts, stabbing with their spears, biting if they have to. The point here is to wear the party down a little bit, make them spend some resources, but also to build ambiance, like a horror movie almost, of the threat that keeps growing and growing the farther they go in. 
the party also discovers a trio of lizard folk here. Um, they're waiting in a side cave. They've come to forge an alliance with the Bullywogs, and they brought a gift. An elf, all trussed up for the Bullywogs to torture or eat or both. Um, the Bullywog chieftain is having them cool their heels for a while while he mulls over their alliance proposal. He's very clever and he wants to see if he can play them against other powers in the region. The party, having fought its way this far, is in no mood to parlay, so they attack the lizard folk on sight and kill them. Then the party finds the elf captive and free him. Calfrey is from the swamp. His people are a wilder branch than Alira's people, and she's fascinated by him. And his people are at war with the lizard folk in the south. And they're losing because the lizard folk shaman possess a strange and new magic that the elves can't fight. This is another breadcrumb, a new adventure path that the PCs may choose to follow, or not. After tangling with the Grey Ooze, the party finally finds the chamber of the Bullywog Chieftain. Uh, Farblex is guarded by a super tough zombie, which is strange because the party hasn't encountered anybody here that has powers of necromancy, and Farblex himself doesn't have them. After defeating the Chieftain, the party finds a letter explaining that the zombie is a gift from someone named Larith of Ghostwood Keep. This name means nothing to them yet, but it will. Also, Farblex wears a jade amulet um, in the shape of a burning eye, which is not familiar to any of the characters. At this point, the party decides to return to the fort. Calfrey, the freed elf, leaves them to go back to the swamp and his people. Once back at the fort, the party goes to the inn to get some rooms and there they find out they have a visitor. Lady Elaine Dombringer is Alira's mother and she's come here from Selene to fetch her daughter back home. The PCs have to sit down with the lady who is an elf of fine culture and breeding and convince her that their mission here is very important and Alira can't go back with her yet. Um, she's impressed by what they've accomplished so far and the strength in Alira's voice as she describes the vision she had is what tips the scale. Uh, the next day she departs back to Selene, giving the party her blessing to continue. And that's where we're going to end today's video. Tune in next time to see more about the campaign and how it progresses. Please hit the subscribe button below and share this video. We really appreciate your support. So until next time, thank you from all of us here at Attacks of Opportunity.